All right, welcome back to Athletes Pursuit. So today we are joined by a special guest. We got Sam Tooley in the house joining us today. We also got Lena on the couch. This is her first debut on the podcast. Could be many more to come. Uh, so we're going to dive into a great conversation with Sam today. Very excited to have him. Um, a little bit of a background if you're not familiar with Sam. He is also a uh, track coach. Yeah, uh, he was a D1 track and field athlete at Fairfield University. He's also the proud owner of Alpha Fit Club, which opened in 2019. It is now going to be up to 13 locations. And he's also the owner of Garage Gym, which has two locations in and of itself. And he's a head coach on the training app Ladder. So the man stays busy. Uh, so I'm excited to have Sam. Look, this is the first time, believe it or not, that I have met Sam in person. I have been witnessing Sam from afar for years since I've joined the scene in New York City. And I've always had a tremendous amount of respect for how he does business, the things that he's accomplished, the clients that he work with, works with, and the way that he presents himself in training. So I've been excited to have this conversation with him. And I was just recently introduced to a talk that Sam recently gave. And understanding a little bit more about his background, um, it's easy to take a quick look at someone like Sam and say, the dude's got it all, great athlete, very successful in business. But it has not been without its challenges. And we're going to talk about that and how we've overcome those types of things and just dive into the story a little bit more. So, Sam, thanks for joining us today, buddy. I appreciate it. Uh, it is crazy to think that this is the first time we're actually just meeting in person. So long overdue. Yeah, man. Um, quite the hype up as well. So hopefully I deliver. And uh, yeah, man, I think it's to your point. We were talking about this before we hopped on. I think it is easy for all of us, myself included, to see the success of what somebody's built, what they've done as they've gone through it, because now we get the benefit of seeing someone go through their journey as they go through it, but only to the extent that they're willing to actually show, right, the, the realness behind it. And it's definitely been a crazy journey to get to this point. And there's been a lot of real moments as you know, to get to here. So uh, excited to dive into it. I, I'm excited for your willingness to share. I know it takes a lot of strength to do that. Um, there's a lot of work that goes in to be that vulnerable and to not even just with yourself, but as a leader to, to share those types of things about yourself. Um, so we'll get into it. Um, before we get into that though, I wanted to start with a little bit about you and your training style. This is something that I'm always very curious about when I meet someone like yourself, because you're such a great athlete right? I mean, you, ru you run well. I know you compete well. Um, you've been doing this for a very long time and you readjusting Lena. Okay. So she's, she's out. Over it. She's over it. Uh, let's talk about your training style a little bit. Sure. Cause I come from a place of like balancing the science and the art because you've been doing this for so long that you can consider this mastery of what you do, right? At least in your personal approach, I have to imagine that you have taken a lot of years of experience. You've learned the, you know, the things that you've read in textbooks, things from different coaches, but how have you taken those years of experience from the scientific side and molded it into a little bit more of a personalized style? Like, how would you describe that? Well, I think one thing to note is what I've gone after has evolved over time, right? And so when I first started, I was a track and field athlete, like we talked about, middle distance, so 800, maybe up to 5K. I ran cross country pretty, pretty competitively as well. Transitioned when I came out of college into longer distance, right? So I jumped back on the track. I was like, whoa, these guys are fast. I don't have that anymore. Uh, jumped onto the roads, did the half marathon, jumped up to half Ironman. So I've gone through a bunch of different disciplines. And as, a, as of late, um, jumped into high rocks, right? And I've been doing high rocks for now five years since they came to the U S in 2019. So did the OG New York city race five years ago. Yep. So I have the benefit too, of trying a lot of different things at the highest level I can possibly do them rather than individually focused on one discipline or one event or one modality of training. I think that's been a benefit because now I can cross reference all of those different um, you know, pursuits and goals and, and events and what have you, and actually understand how maybe training for one of them does benefit the other, right? And so mm. thinking about how training for a half, uh, a half Ironman or a half marathon, something much longer, some of those principles, some of the things that I've learned, some of the people that I've coached, there's things that are transferable to what I'm doing even for high rocks. And so having kind of this broad range of experience, both for myself and the athletes I've coached has really given me uh, just a varied insight into what I now 
know and leverage when I train myself and then other, you know, other clients and, and whatnot. That, what, what are some of those training principles? Cause you're, you're, you've all, I'm, I'm assuming you've been always an endurance type athlete. Yeah. Is that more your focus? So it's pretty funny, man. I mean, I have to say I was a really mediocre athlete growing up. So I played every sport under the sun, uh, was only good at them because I was the fastest kid on the field. And so that's the, the level of my athleticism is actually just being fit speed. Yeah. It's just fast. Um, <laughs> And that's fine, right? That was all good. It worked for me. I was able to really just drill down into track and field and excel there because because I was mediocre, I had to work my ass off. And so that work ethic was just part of my DNA. It came naturally. I was applauded for working hard. So I really appreciate you telling everybody that I'm a great athlete. I, I'm not. I'm just a hard worker. Um, but now at this point, I have a foundation of fitness that does allow me to excel when I toe the line. So I think a few things that... Um, I've really leaned into as of late and that I've had to remind myself of is less is more, right? And mm. I think oftentimes we just feel like more is better and and I've never seen that to be the case, not for anyone, right? There's a certain limit that everyone has and it's different for everybody, but a certain limit where as soon as you go beyond, you're actually getting diminishing returns, right? And it's finding out what that kind of best bang for your buck is for you. And there's a bunch of different ways that we can do that. That's been incredibly important for myself, my own training. Because again, going back to, I want to work hard. I love to work hard. It feels yeah. great. I love training, sometimes to my own detriment. Finding out what that is for me and then finding out what that is for my athletes is crucial to make sure that we're just training at the right level to actually reach the goal, exceed the goal, feel as good as we can, get to the line of a race healthy enough to execute. Um, so I think that that idea of less is more has been foundational with my own training and what I really preach to a lot of clients who need to hear it maybe more than I do. Mm, I think it's probably one of the most difficult things for people to wrap their head around. I was guilty of it too. It was a lot of overtraining because you do think that if I work harder and harder and you have this strong work ethic and to some degree, yeah, you're going to make strides. But we talk about training principles. You got to allow for recovery. It's one of the principles of performance, right? If you're in, Otherwise, you're just battling fatigue. But how did you realize that lesson with yourself what was the burnout period you faced uh so for me it was more just it was it was injury focused to start right so I was always dealing especially coming back as a different athlete so give you an example is when I went to college I was 120 pounds okay 120 pounds quit the track team after my freshman year of college or more so was really politely asked to to not be on the track team because I was having too good of a time came back after putting on 40 pounds of muscle right so I went from being 120 to 160 and then tried running again and it was running with like a weight vest, basically. So I came back, I started doing my thing, and immediately it was plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, you name it. And so it was, my body wasn't in a position to absorb the training that I once did, or even close to that, because my body itself was different. Mm -hmm. I was a different athlete. So I had to change. I said I had to kind of go back to the drawing board, think about different ways to build maybe the aerobic foundation that I knew I needed to exceed. And that meant getting in the pool. That meant getting on the bike less ground and pound with a heavier body yielded, quite frankly, better results because I was able to, when I did run, run for quality, run for efficiency, and just really focus in on the things that I needed to, but still build the aerobic foundation that I needed uh, to pair with that quality um, just in different ways. So really it was, I bit off more than I could chew. Uh, I had to take a step back. And through that process, I just said, as I ease into this, let's make sure I do that. Let's make sure I actually ease into this and see where I can go with as little training as possible. Yeah, it's. I think you got to feel that to know how to make the adjustment. Uh, at least I did, and and my experience as a coach, this is a huge thing to wrap your head around. That less is more. Paying a little bit more to the intention of what you're doing, playing with degrees of intensity. These up and down moments. It doesn't always have to be this hardcore day. Uh, I think it does a little bit more. To your point, diminishing returns. So I think one thing that I, I probably should note too is uh, really trying to educate my clients and my athletes, right? Because I was able to train everybody from Olympic, uh, Olympic trials qualifiers in the marathon to your first time 5K folks, right? Um, and I had an ability, probably due in part to my coach, right? Who had an incredible ability to connect with different levels of runners, right? It didn't matter if you were the state champion on the team, the school record holder. We were one of the best teams in New Jersey public school history when I was growing up. So you had those studs, but we were also the biggest school uh, in terms of track team size going to meets. We had 300 kids on my high school track team. Wow. 
usually that's pretty that's bigger than most graduating classes. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, it's massive. So it was, it was almost twenty percent of the school was on the track team. He had an incredible ability to connect with different people of different abilities, different backgrounds, and really coach them and bring out the most in them. So I watched that right, and that completely changed who I was as well. He saw an angry kid who wanted to work hard, wasn't that talented, but could do the things and got the most out of me, right? One of the things he taught us was the idea of just a certain level of effort, right? So we talk about RPE, rate of perceived effort. Um, We usually hear that more so in the weight room, right? With strength training. Now we've taken that and we've brought that to the track and to running because one of the examples that I'll give is, let's say uh, you you show up one day and you're exhausted. I say, listen, I want you to do this tempo run at an eight out of 10 effort level. The results are going to be different if you're exhausted or if you're fresh. But as long as you abide by the effort that we're actually looking for, that's perfect for me. And so I think giving people permission to just stop worrying about the watch, stop worrying about the data. So much of our our worlds now is so data heavy that I think people rely on it too much. If we can train people to really connect with their body and actually understand that the effort is the output that they're putting out there that's a that's a secret skill set because it transcends to race day as well and the ability to kind of like flow with how you're feeling and mitigate how you're feeling that's you've got to be connected and tapped into your body a little bit as well which i think comes back to kind of that art how do you yeah i was it, it is a bit of an art to that because i would imagine it's it's a bit of experience it's a bit of following maybe a strict program having the coaching but like how did you navigate that how did you get to a point of getting more on f- a, a feeling process with your training I was really fortunate to be a part of a great team where you almost, it's so funny, running is such an individual sport, right? Until it's not. And then all of a sudden you're a part of this team and you are you almost run as a unit when you show up at practice, right? You, you click off 400 meter repeats, you, you go for a progression run or a tempo run, you start to kind of lean on your teammates in moments that you need it and feel their energy as you're running. And so I think I was fortunate because that's how I started my running journey, right? And then eventually you get out there and you are on your own and you've got to figure out what feels right. When can you push? When do you need to pull back? Specifically in the longer events, whether it's a half marathon or what have you. Um, It's really, it takes time. You know, I think that's the other part of this is you're not going to learn that overnight. It takes time. It takes reps. It takes putting yourself out there. It takes failing. um, And races provide an incredible opportunity to do all of that. Yeah, it's such a, it's such a skill. I think about my evolution of myself and then you see these commonalities of people that are just starting the journey and where they can go. And you see some of these blocks, these mental blocks that they have. And some people, you just see them quit too early before they can even realize these things. You know, it really is like this evolutionary process that you go through. Let's go back to this real quick, Sam. So you mentioned that you were an angry runner and I cannot relate to anything more, my friend. I love to lift angry. I talk about it all the time. Some of my best workouts come from just being a little bit, honestly, going through whatever I've been going through in life and channeling that emotion and using training as a form of therapy. Um, and I've heard you talk a lot about that, but let's dive into that. Why, where did this come from? What was this idea of you being an angry runner and what, where was your head at in that space? I mean, I think there's... Part of this, right, is that we we tell ourselves stories enough times to, to to make them true, right? And so I this is how I remember it now, 15 years later. But I think it's pretty spot on in that I, you know, I found the track because I didn't have my own thing, right? I didn't, all of my buddies were incredible athletes. D1, scholarships, you name it, um, you know, soccer at Cornell, Colgate, like all these incredible Division One schools, baseball player of the year in New Jersey, you name it. So like incredible athletes. And then there was me. And so I think I was a little pissed off from the start that I was like the little kid on the team, never really had it. All of my buddies were stars. I think that was the start of it. Right. But I think what really cemented it was just my home life. To be honest with you, I was, you know, uh, growing up in a family where my parents constantly fought. Um, There was addiction in, in the family. So my home itself, outside looking in, perfect inside looking out, not so much. And I lived in that house. And so I wanted to get out of it pretty quickly, um, which I did. But for the time being, the only place that I really could find a consistent outlet, one that uh, that really felt like a punching bag was the track. So the track became my punching bag. And fortunately for me, 
it was met with, right, that fight in me was met with applause and recognition and championships and school records and all of the things that you, that I was seeking, right, that recognition and that home, um, I was able to find on the track. But I would show up some days and was just so pissed off that I was going to have to leave there and walk into my house and know, I knew what I was walking into. I didn't want to go there, but um, I got to at least take out some of that frustration when I was at practice, and my coach and my teammates felt and saw that often. How did that, how did you use that then? So I could imagine that there could be a benefit to it. We talk about work ethic, and you're probably staying in the gym maybe a little bit longer, but where did it help you? Where did it hurt you in your career at that, 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 that age? So I think where it helped me was, and I'll paint a, a pretty vivid picture for you, right? So track came pretty naturally to me. I was, I was pretty damn good at it pretty early on, and that was, that was pretty obvious. Where I wasn't great was cross country. Cross country was hard, right? Uh, 5K, all out, just burned, right? Practice for it was hard. It just didn't come as naturally. So for me, I think uh, I would ask myself a question when I was racing, and I would ask myself it in moments of pain and discomfort and what have you. And it would be a question of like, how bad do you want it? It was this mantra that would run through my head pretty consistently. And so I remember I would step to the line, I was pissed off, gun would go off, I would lead the race mile one every single time. I had no business. Oh, you came out hot. Never did, had no business because we knew I wasn't winning the race. (laughs) But anyways, got out there and then eventually people would start to pass me, more of these top dogs. Like when I say that, I mean these guys would go on to win true state championships individually, you know, Nike, Northeast, whatever. Um, Mile two like you're in pain and you're like hyperventilating. You're like, I got to just finish this thing and I got to go. And that's, I would be able to tap into that anger in a way that would propel me to the finish way faster than I would have if I didn't have that without question. Where it hurt is it probably took a hell of a lot of the joy out of what could have been an incredible experience with amazing teammates and what have you, where every day I was showing up ready to go to war versus these other kids who are probably just having the time of their life with a lot of great friends. Yeah. So we were in two different modes. And again, I don't know if I, I honestly, looking back, I don't know if I would have been the athlete I would have been, I I became without that anger, without that chip on my shoulder. Um, But I probably would have enjoyed it a hell of a lot more like a normal 16 year old kid had I not been angry. It's a lot of pressure to take on at that age. I can imagine that, you know, as you're mentioning, there's a great deal of focus that goes into that. You can channel that energy, which is, it feel, it, it seems like you really did at that time. Um, but when you do that, you know, laws of life, I feel like you get a little bit out of balance then at some point. So you you get to college, but let's talk about that. You get into a a full ride. No, uh, no partial scholarship. Okay. And, uh, it was actually, I was actually supposed to go to NYU, right? So I was, I was used to being on a team that was championship caliber, right? Now I was third man on that team. Uh, at least in terms of cross country, we were the fastest team in school history, best public school in the state. So I was I was fighting for a spot on a team that was going to go do things. And I love that idea. So NYU was one of the top D3 schools in the country every year for track and field. It's also an incredible academic school compared to where I was going to go. My book bag had a permanent spot in the backseat of my car. I was totally cool with that. I loved getting straight B's by doing zero work. B's get degrees. It was awesome. And I was <laughs> so, get degrees, I was yeah. so proud of it. Um, <laughs> But so I was supposed to go to NYU. Uh, coach said, you're in. Let's do this thing. I was so stoked. I remember I would wear the shirt around school. I'm like, this is where I'm going to school day. Eventually, I didn't get in. Coach never called me. Two weeks into like where I was supposed to get the thumbs up and the letter, uh, I reached out to the coach. I, w- I remember sitting on the stairs calling him. And this just goes back to angry Sam. He's like, yeah, man, unfortunately, we couldn't get you in. Um, we'd love for you to transfer in after the first year. I was like, you didn't have the balls to call me? I remember saying that verbatim to like the coach. I was like, you didn't have the balls to call me? I was like, I told every other school I wasn't coming. Clemson, Wake Forest, all of these D1 schools that I would have had to like fight to get in and leverage the track team, Yeah, didn't get in. So I went back to the drawing board and I saw Fairfield University on the beach, 60% girls. I was like, I'm in. Oh, Sam, I didn't I, know this. I was like, I'm coming, right? <laughs> I was like, done. But at that point... It was after uh, a fantastic senior year for me. Um, I had done really, really well on the track in cross country. Um, You know, just felt like I was on top of the world, quite frankly. And 
I had worked so hard to get to that point that I was definitely a little burnt out by the time that that summer came around. And then so much change when you go to college, right? So much of your identity is up in the air. You don't have the same friends. I think for me, it wasn't cool to show up at Fairfield U and be like the fastest kid on the cross country team. Mm. That wasn't like that. I wanted to fit in and be accepted and make these new friends. I also always, I always had a good time. So I was like, I'm going to go out and meet everybody. My priorities shifted tremendously. So I remember uh, there was a picture of me double fisting beers first week of college. And the captains of the cross country team came in and they were like, dude, uh, this can't happen. I was like, beat me in a race and then we'll talk. Oh. That, was, that was my mode that year. Okay. Um, so by the end of that year, I said I was going to recommit. I was going to do my thing. I had gotten to hop back on the track, which was great in the spring. And uh, I just, something just... I didn't have that fire in me. I didn't have that anger anymore. I was like, I'm out of the house. I'm up at college. I'm having a good time. That chip wasn't weighing on me. I didn't have anything to prove at that point. So I basically quit. Where did, where did the fire go? What, what changed? Well, so I don't think it was a constant. There wasn't that constant pressure. There wasn't that constant, I'm going to go home. What is home going to be like? What are my parents going to be doing? I didn't have to face that. And so I think I was able to kind of just escape in a different way for the first time ever. I had freedom, right? Now, I went home that summer and ended up moving out of my house at 19 years old because as soon as I came back, I was met with the same shit that I was there, if not worse. And also with this sense of almost like entitlement to like, I don't need to be here anymore. I can go and do my own thing. So I had moved out. And if I'm looking back on that time and being honest with myself, that summer, while I had the time of my life, was probably the beginning of what ultimately would be my demise in in college. And that leads us to what? So you have this radical, what's the shift that happened there? That shift of, I go back to school, sophomore year, have the time of my life, start partying even more. I had no responsibilities because I wasn't on the track team anymore. All I had was free time. The outlet that I once had in terms of the track became partying and Ah. having a good time. What was interesting, though, was that it went from becoming a want to becoming a need. And so by the time I was a junior in college, fast forward another year, and it kept getting a little bit more intensive, a little bit more intensive. Um, My junior year of college, I ended up getting academically released from the university. I got a letter sent home that I opened up like three weeks after getting it saying, you've been dismissed from the university. I had failed three classes because I stopped showing up. I thought I was like above it or something. I I honestly can't tap into where my mind was at the time. It was not in a good spot. But I do remember feeling so incredibly anxious and depressed and unfulfilled during my junior year that by the time I got to my senior year, I was as as accurately as I can you know describe it. I was such a shell of myself. I would go into conversations like this. I would never actually have a conversation like this, mind you, but I would go into conversations and I would hope that you couldn't tell that I felt so off. I was not at home in my own skin. And so to me, that was such a hopeless and lost point where I had no direction, nothing, um, nothing empowering me to do anything. And I didn't even feel like I could articulate how I was feeling to other people. So you go from, yes, this angry, charged up kid who could just go do anything that he set his mind to because he was going to work up and, you know, show up and work hard to the, the complete opposite of that within four years. So is it like a, because it seems like a slow, somewhat of a slow process to get to a point where you're running track freshman year to junior year, having a period where you're basically getting asked to be released and you're choosing a little bit more partying, which which is a natural thing to do in college. I mean, obviously, we're going to go out. I mean, I sure did, but I also wasn't playing sports at the time, so it's a different thing to balance. Uh, were you conscious of what was happening at the time? I was conscious but unwilling to do anything about it. So you were aware that you were choosing drinking at the time over track? Oh, I was I was aware I was I – was, Uh, choosing drinking and doing drugs over everything else in my life because I just wanted to numb myself from feeling that way that I described to you. The only time that I could get to a semblance of normalcy, of feeling like I was at all myself or at all home in my own body was when I was on the verge of blacking out and getting drunk because 
I was just numb and I wanted to fast forward through the days. And I do, I will say this, and it's, it's super sad for me to reflect on the time. But I remember I went to, so I went to Fairfield U up in Connecticut. And I remember driving home uh, through the Mayor Partway, which is like a beautiful, you know, kind of like landscape, whatever. And I would, I would literally cry on my way home to New Jersey and think about maybe fantasize, but never even close to actually doing anything, but think about crashing my car and think about, I just want to stop feeling this way. And yet then you'd go home and you'd have to be like, school's, you know, school's great. I'm doing well, whatever. Mm -hmm. I became so good. And I learned to do this in high school too. When I really think about it is I I got so good at putting on the facade that everything was all good. I could talk about the businesses we were starting at school and that I was going to the gym and that we were having the time out, you know, whatever. Um, but to be able to do that and feel so empty is a scary skill set as well. And I was able to do that in high school and people would, you know, I'd walk around as the class clown, smiling, having a good time, racing, whatever. I had everything, but I was so broken and so angry. And so that was a, that was a, a long time coming until eventually it just became too much. And what was, so now we're in this spot, like how long did this continue from your senior year? Like what was, what was kind of the wake up moment for you? to start making a change? Because obviously we're in a very different spot. So this becomes something I would imagine to be a very pivotal moment where you have like this choice. But what what was the wake up for you? Yeah, you know what was interesting, man, is I, I have to say there, there absolutely was a moment, right? But it was so unexpected and it was not a rock bottom. No one else at least, right? I think when we think about rock bottom, we can visualize what that looks like for someone, right? There, there's It's so obvious. And yet for me, I was so good at covering it up and no one ever really held me accountable, to be honest with you. I think mm. that was one of the hard parts was that nobody ever, no matter what I did, it was never so egregious that people had to sit me down and talk to me, um, or at least that's how it felt. And so we fast forward here to my super senior year. Didn't graduate on time, which was a moment in and of itself that I'll never forget. Watching my buddies walk across the stage at graduation as I sit next to my parents with a water bottle of vodka, taking a shot every time a buddy would go across the stage, having stayed up for 24 hours the night before. And by the time our graduation party was over, I was blacked out, sitting on the beach, crying to my mom that I was a failure. Like that's a, that's a vivid, vivid memory that I have where I'm like, I never want to go back to being that guy. But fast forward and I'm a fifth year senior. All of my buddies are going on to get their masters. I'm working at a dump during the day and I'm taking class at night. I was always able to still put together some semblance of responsibility by having a job and going to class and hitting the gym. And then on the weekends, I'd live for the weekends and what have you, right? So there was always some bit of moderation in my very lackluster discipline yeah. to do the right thing. And it's my fifth year. I'm living in an unfinished basement because nobody had room for me in their freaking house. I had to sleep in a tent because there were spiders that would crawl down in the middle of the night in this unfinished basement because there was no room anywhere else. So they called it my spider cave. Like it was just a very sad, <laughs> like sad and funny, but not cool. And this um, is in Connecticut? This is in Connecticut. I was gonna say, how much were you paying? Uh, maybe 600 bucks a month or something like that. So expensive. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a weekly paycheck for me at the dump. Wow. So um, my grandparents came up, who I'm super close with, and they said, we are going to do an intervention for your mom. Uh, my mom was the family member who was dealing with addiction in our family. It had been going on since I was in late middle school, early high school. Is why I was so angry you know, at home. And part of me was like, where the fuck you been? Like, why are we doing this now? It's literally been 10 years of this. But the other part of me was like, cool. I'm connecting dots in my mind. Cool. So mom's going to go get help. That's great. I don't believe it's going to work, but that's great. And I could come home and I could take care of my brother and I could get out of this basement and I can get out of working at the dump and I can get out of going to school. It was like the perfect scapegoat. Mm. So I agreed. I came home, went to visit my mom at the rehab facility that she went to, uh, incredible facility in Pennsylvania called Karen. It's like one of the top four rehabilitation centers in the, in the country. And we went and we went for a family weekend, which is a really weird moment uh, as a child to go see your parents in that setting. Just bizarre. Right? It's hard to describe. Uh, I had no interest in going for that reason. And I was like, I just want to see her when she's good, when it's fixed. Yeah. And thank goodness I went because I sat there 
and I listened to a woman share her story as I sat next to my brother, sat next to my grandparents. I, uh, I remember listening to it to the point that, you know, everyone in the room, she was describing what it felt like to deal with a family member who was struggling with addiction. Everybody in the room could relate to that story. But then she transitioned her story into what it felt like to be the person dealing with addiction. And, you know, everyone's pretty stoic in the room. My foot went from tapping to my stomach almost turning to me almost getting sick to the point that I had to go outside and calm myself down because the feelings that she was talking about was exactly what I articulated to you earlier, where I felt hopeless and lost and without purpose and wanting to fast forward through my days and numb myself from whatever. They agree. <laughs> they agree. And uh, it was one of those things where I related so heavily to what she was saying, that I needed to pull myself outside, regroup, ask myself if I was overreacting, and for whatever reason, so out of character at the time, I went back inside, I pulled that woman aside, and I, I said, am I overreacting? Because everything you just said, I feel. We sat for two hours together. Wow. In the middle of this family weekend, we sat for two hours together. She said, if you leave here, it will be the biggest mistake of your life. And I had to sit with that. And I remember I called my two best friends. I called my dad. Eventually, I talked to my mom. My mom kind of heard through the counselors that I had done this. And she pulled me aside and she was like, I've, I've always known that we were really similar. Um, she's like, but I had no idea. You know, it was, we were similar in this way. She had her reservation. She had her fears. I definitely showed some tendencies. Um, but for a mom to know that her child was feeling this way or for my dad who had no idea, for everybody who had always supported me to know that I was hurting the way that I was hurting broke their hearts. And so um, I will say I was, it was probably the, one of the bravest things I've ever done was I checked myself in and I stayed in rehab for 30 days, um, which was a, an incredible journey, experience, whatever you want to call it, where they actually placed me at 23 years old mind you, with all of the 45-year-old men because I was so mature in their mind to have checked myself in that I didn't belong with the 18-year-olds or the 20-year-olds who had been court-ordered there or forced there by their parents. And so you can imagine tiny Sam, no tattoos, no nothing, you know, uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, Westfield, New Jersey, preppy little kid with these guys who had been in, you know, rehab 17 times who had overdosed on heroin, who had lost everything. And I'm sitting there and they are looking at me like, who the fuck is this kid? Why is he here? And then one week in after enough, you know, talking to them and sharing my story and working through my own shit, there was no doubt that I, I belonged in that room. And by the end of it, I started leading the men in that room. And because I just... I had a unique ability to share my perspective, be vulnerable, talk as we're talking right now, and they ended up respecting it, right? And it was during that 30 days where I reminded myself for the first time in years who I was, what I was capable of, what I wanted, the vision for my life. I was able to have hard conversations with myself, be super honest about my shortcomings, my unwillingness to do X, Y, and Z, and... I was so proud of myself for doing the right thing for the first time in God knows how long. Uh, fast forward again, and I did 60 days in a sober living environment in Scranton, Pennsylvania with a bunch of 25-year-old kids and did that process again where I started leading now people who are more my peers, more my age, waking them up to the reality that, yo, we're in a sober living house. Like, we, we need to get our shit together. We need to work on this. Um, so that, that period of time allowed me to step up and do the right thing and be a leader again. Because I always saw myself as a leader, but I wasn't living into that. And there was a huge disconnect there. So that was, that was the bravest and probably most transformative window of my life without question. Was that, it sounds like that was the first time you had a space to just speak on these things is honestly... It sounds like you needed to. Had you done any therapy prior to that? Nah, outside of maybe when I was in third grade and I saw, thought somebody was in my closet with Miss Lillian. 
She got me playing board games. I'm like, Miss Lillian, there's someone in my closet. The board game's not going to help. Like, we got to learn jujitsu <laughs> or some shit. Yeah. Like, Miss yeah. Lillian, put, the, put trouble away. Um, no, I had never done anything. Um, I had never done anything. So it was a huge, I mean, you just, you needed that. And you just stepped in really to this leadership role there. Uh, what were some of those conversations you had? Like, I'm curious, trying to get into your head at that point, like something starts to click where you're seeing, I can imagine, are you seeing glimpses of like your, an alternate future with some of these people as you're hearing these stories? I think what was, what was real for me, um, during that process was I saw what life could be if I didn't handle my business, meaning how fortunate I was to be in there with a bunch of 45 year old guys and be so fearful of being back there at 45. And I knew then what I didn't want for myself. And I had lived with that for a bit, right? I, I, I had seen the struggle that my mom had gone through, seen, seen the struggle that my parents had gone through, felt the struggle that our family went through, all of that. So I knew very clearly what I didn't want. And it was pretty straightforward to me what it meant to, quite frankly, just do the opposite of that, right? And so much of it was predicated on just taking responsibility for my actions. Because to my point earlier, Nobody was holding me accountable. And if nobody, you know, if I didn't hold myself accountable, nothing was going to change. Were you scared to step into yourself at all at that time? Was there a part of you that was just scared to realize your potential? I think there was, a, there was um, an unwillingness for the first time, ironically, bring it back to who I was as a track athlete, someone willing to do the hard work. I just... I, I wasn't willing to do the hard work in, in the other areas of my life. Something interesting that we can probably get to later is like what came easy for me was working hard in my fitness, right? Yeah. What came very challenging to me was working hard on myself in a real way. And I was able to get by to a certain extent, at least externally speaking, by never doing that work. And yet I was like pitying myself and just in, in this miserable state. Uh, and so I think that was the... The, the disconnect there was willing the willingness to do the hard work that I, I maybe knew I needed to do. Um, and it just became so abundantly clear that if like, if it doesn't, if I don't change, if I don't make an adjustment here, I'm only going to keep going in the wrong direction. Yeah. And who knows what that could look like. Yeah. There's like a, I think it catches up to all of us, man. I think this is where real courage comes from. Cause I know that it's easy to avoid this work. I did it myself for years, whether it was consciously or unconsciously even, but there's a lot to be learned too, man. Like we, ha we actually have a lot of overlap with our stories. I've, I've seen my father battle alcoholism and there was a fear too, as a kid, man, you talk about stepping into adulthood, like seeing like you're a kid one moment and then you see someone you look up to so adamantly struggle. And then you almost step into this, you're like thrown into adulthood. And you're almost not ready for it. And like seeing someone struggle like that, I always had this fear of becoming that, of repeating the pattern. And it took me a lot of time. Like I avoided that too. I avoided that work for a long time. Uh, I just ran and I think moved through life with a lot of fear. Um, but how, what was the work that you started to do to, to meet yourself now? Because now we're having a realization. You're starting to recognize like something needs to, alter so now what's the next step like what did you start to build off of after after rehab how do you continue this work yeah you know what's interesting is i think for the first time ever in that process because at that point you know i threw all caution to the wind and i'm like who cares what anybody else thinks about me at this point right like here i am uh checking myself into rehab and at that point like you can't really be concerned over what is everybody else going to think about me right? Like you're coming out and it's a new world. It just is. And I finally gave my pers myself permission to live life on my own terms for myself. And so I took a random job at selling cash registers out of Binghamton, New York to independent grocery stores, right? I just wanted to like get back on track. So one of the funniest jobs I've ever had in my life for sure. But during that time, my dad, who always had my back, he just said, what do you actually want to do, man? Like you're living life on your terms now. You're doing stuff for you. You're running again. You're training again. Um, you know, you're reading again. You're writing, right? There was, I was doing so many things that I had strayed away from for such a long time. And I, 
I said to myself during that process, what do I have to get back to, to be the best version of myself? Mm -hmm. And it was running, it was training, it was doing meditation and yoga. It was doing all the things that actually made me feel full versus drained. And so I was, I was checking a lot of boxes, building momentum, right? Into who, you know, who, who Sam actually could be, right? So you're talking, you know, talking about a vision for myself. I was really fortunate to, to have my dad who continued to help push me in the direction of fulfilling that vision. And so I was honest. I said, I want to, I want to come home and coach, right? I talked about the impact that my coach had on me. That was, I had somebody who believed in me more than I believed in myself in mm. high school. And granted, so did everybody truly. Like when I really think about that and even say it, like my dad, my mom, my grandparents, like my whole family, my friends, everybody always believed in me way more than I believed in myself and like kept giving me moments and opportunity during high school, during track, what have you to go show it, to go show it off. And, uh, I, I wanted to fight for that again. And so I wanted to also create that for other people. And I was just so compelled to helping people never feel like how I felt. And that was, it really was, that is, I remember so vividly journaling about it. I said, I want to go home and coach and help these kids believe in what's possible for them. And the only way I know how to do that, or at least where people will trust me the most to do that, will be on track. Yeah. So I raised my hand. I said to my high school coach, I said, I want to come home and coach. He welcomed me back with open arms, right? So here I was getting to work with who was the assistant coach at the time, who was like one of my guys. And he said, come back, come back and coach. Let's do this thing. So I was, I, I was welcomed back to my high school where we, we did all those things, biggest track team in the state. Um, and I got to just, I got to just show up and do what I loved or what I felt like I was called to do. And it was so evident so early on that I, I was supposed to be there doing this thing. It just felt like home, right? We talk about being home in your body, whatever. Yeah, I was home. I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And um, that was, that's what, that's, that was the catalyst for all of this. It's like you gotta, dude, I, so much respect for this. I, I think this is where great coaches are made, to be honest, because you go through these difficult moments and it's like you can now become what you needed at the time, right? You're helping these kids and connecting in such a deeper way and giving them this guidance that you know the mental battles that are happening. Because, dude, looking at your story right now, I'm like, like you said, you have all this skill, you have all this talent. And what was missing was more you, like you believing in you. Yeah, it was, um, I think what was the, the best part about it was I wasn't there specifically to get them faster. I wasn't there to like help them get a PR, right? I was, I was there to help give them the same mindset to, you know, just toolkit, everything that I, I fostered over those years, whether it was being the kid on the track team who had no business going to win a state championship and the work that it took to go do that. It was somebody who had been to hell and back in terms of the own kind of mental warfare, dealing with shit at home, right? When I, I remember I was hired as, eventually I got hired as the youngest head track coach in the state of New Jersey at St. Joe's in Metuchen. I was 24, 25 years old. And uh, it was pretty much a year and a half after I was the volunteer track coach at my high school. And I remember during my first speech to the team, I looked at them, a small team, and I said, every single one of you has some shit that you're dealing with. I was like, every single one of your teammates has something that they're trying to work through. I said, you have no idea what these kids are going through on your team. I was like, so when you're here, you're here for one another, right? And very few people talk like that to a bunch of high school kids, yeah. right? But that realization for these kids, and they, they leaned into it, right? Like you saw that connectivity, you saw that brotherhood. Um, that was so impactful, dude. It was so special to witness, to help foster, to help create and be really intentional about. And I almost miss that mindset because now as I have more things going on and I'm not involved with coaching at the high school and whatnot, part of me misses how simple my mission was at that time to just show up, be with these kids, be present, be there for them and allow them the outlet that I had for two hours at the track. That was also so simple, right? It was show up, work hard, get better. Um, be there for your teammates. Like just the simple rules of being a great teammate, great athlete. Um, part of me misses that because of how complex my life is now with all of the obligations, responsibilities, opportunities. Sure. Uh, it was just so pure, right? And so part of me wants to eventually go back to that and be the coach in the stands, 
just giving back in that way and, and filling up my own bucket because it was so self-serving too, but for all the right reasons. Yeah, that's a deep connection, man. I mean, that, that's when we talk about the power of community. There's nothing better than that. Um, this is where it can be so much more than just training. I mean, like it's a healthy outlet. It's a place to grow and step into yourself. And these kids, they need it, man, it, more more than ever probably now. Um, can we talk a little bit about your relationship with your father? Because I'm, I'm, I'm curious a little bit more about that. I Like, I man, I, I looked up to my dad more than more than anything in the world, you know, um, trying to emulate what he did and, and hearing how he, he wanted you to really step into yourself. Um, was that always the case with him? Was he always kind of encouraging you to just kind of go out into your own and live life on your terms? Um, I'd say, yeah, for the most part. And it's funny cause you know, memories fade as time goes on and what have you. And yeah. I think, um, you know, the way that I remember my dad and everybody would, would tell me the same is, uh, I had me and my brother had no bigger fan. Like the only thing that my dad talked about was me and my brother, right? So, so much of his life was predicated around making sure we grew up with everything that we could possibly need, including his love and support, right? As we grew older, I would say my dad became a little bit more of a peer for me than he did a parent. Mm. Um, I think when you grow up in a family that struggles with uh, addiction and divorce and things like that, it does, to your point, require you to grow up really quickly. So I was always the 15, 16, 17-year-old taking care of my mom or trying to taking care of my dad or trying to putting on the Superman cape and taking care of my little brother or trying to. And so your perspective of your parents, I think changes as you get older and you realize they too have their own shit going on as well. And they're just trying to figure it out and nobody's perfect. Um, And so I think, you know, I, there was a level of respect and understanding there on my part as I grew older with my dad. And there was also a, a level of frustration being like, where's the, you know, where's the person who's going to take care of me and lead me and our family? And so it was dual wielding. But in terms of his, uh, his support of me going and chasing my dreams, it's, I still get emotional thinking about how emotional my dad would be sitting here, hearing me talk about this, but also seeing what we've gone on to create in the gyms and uh, just everything that we have going on. I think it would absolutely blow his mind which is, you know, makes me feel really good. Did you, ha- did you share these visions for the gym? Did you have these kind of visions of what you're doing now early on that you shared with him? No, this, he passed away that first season that I was coaching. And so everything was just in its infancy. I don't think I had these dreams when I first moved back home. The only thing that I was, uh, and I don't mean to diminish it, but the only thing that I was up to was a volunteer coach at the high school and going back to school to get my teaching degree because I wanted to be a gym teacher. So as I left it with my dad, I would be going on to be a middle school gym teacher and hopefully coaching track at the high school. And again, he would probably be the first person to believe you if you told him where I'm at today. He'd say, of of course he did. Like, of course he went and did that. Um, There would be no, not a moment of doubt, but I think there would be a tremendous sense of, of pride. That's huge, man. I can't imagine <laughs> seeing what you've built and what you've done. It's it's inspiring to say the least. Um, dude, I, I just relate to it heavy, as you know. Um, it, it's, it's the worst club to be a part of, is how I heard it put. But I will say this, like, to relate to you, because um, I've talked to openly about losing my father. I lost him in, in 2016. He had a brain tumor and, and battled with that. I heard uh, I heard Bradley Cooper actually talk about he lost his father as well. And there was something that as my brother and I were battling with that for at least, I mean, you still battle with it, but specifically that first year, I remember Bradley Cooper having this statement where he said, um, it was one of the hardest, most difficult times you could ever go through. And it was also at the same time, strangely, one of the biggest gifts that he ever gave. Cause you take that moment and you can respond to it. I remember having that conversation with my brother of, you know, your father, you're still young and you think you're going to have these years with him. And so there's this natural response of what's the point? Like we face that of like, I I could just sit in this and like sulk in this. Like I wasn't happy with my situation either uh, with my, with my life and where I was at that time. But having this conversation with Chris, my brother, we made like this vow to each other to not waste what this was. And to live the rest of our lives in honor 
of, of this man, like to build a legacy around him and what he taught us to not put it to waste. So in that way, it became one of the largest catalysts for both of us in our lives to where I, I wouldn't be here sitting with you if that hadn't happened. It was like this fire that was created. And I'm curious what your response was to that yourself. If some of that allowed you to step in even deeper to who you are now growing in more into yourself. I think that's the power of having someone else in it with you, right? Because I don't know if it was just me, um, how I would have responded, but I too had my brother who was so much younger than me. How much, how, what, how much older? we're about two years apart, two years apart. younger. So, yeah. um, with Jake, my brother, six years younger, he was just a baby in my mind. Right. And, um, as I had always done, I always felt like I needed to show up and, and quite frankly, take care of him. It just was my mindset. Um, looking back on it, he did a lot of taking care of me to really, when I really think about it. But um, the response was more a responsibility, less, quite frankly, less to honor my dad and more to show up for my brother. And it was just, I have to show Jake that we don't have to go backwards because dad's gone. Um, we get to go forwards. And I was already, I was so uh, fresh into coaching and, and getting my shit together and doing the right things. I was so on that mission that it felt, it would have felt so inauthentic to myself. It would have felt so forced, quite frankly, such a cop out to, to do anything other than show up for my brother and say, we can go do this and I'm going to show you. Um, so I was so fortunate to have Jake there as a found as, as my rock, as my purpose, as my foundation to not retreat and go back to old ways. Because again, I really don't think anybody would have been like, I really don't think anybody would have held me accountable if I'd gone back and started drinking again. They would have understood. They would have gotten it. They would have been like, oh, well, like, listen, man, like, you lost your dad. I don't blame you. Now, yeah. good friends and, and whatnot would have challenged me without question, yep. right? as, they, as they always have and, and for, forever will. Um, but in those moments, you know, who can blame you for doing anything? You just lost one of the most important people in your life. Yeah. I'm very fortunate, though, that similar to you, uh, I took it as, a, as almost like a challenge to myself to, to rise up rather than retreat back. And uh, so much of that was in part of just showing up for my brother. Yeah. That's one of the most powerful motives, honestly, I could think of. Cause I, dude, it was something I was thinking about as you're telling this, like there, there has to be this battle internally that as you're going through, like life is throwing you curveballs, man, like some really intense challenges and you're on the road to just improvement. You're like, I'm getting my stuff together. I'm growing it. I'm stepping into myself. You're doing all the right things. You're getting healthy. You're getting on track. You're creating good habits. And this tragedy with your father happens. Um, you, what is that battle internally of reverting? I mean, what is that? What, how intense was it early on? If it was, if it, it was at all and how do you keep yourself on track? Cause, cause look, let's be honest. I mean, we're human beings, man. Like even with, even with your brother there, there has to be moments. There's gotta be some dark moments. Like what, what was, what did you say to yourself? What really kept you going and pulling back? You got to remember, I was so good at being angry, too. <laughs> I was. And so that felt very familiar to be frustrated by my circumstances. Um, and so it wasn't a foreign feeling at all to just say, here, you know, here we go again, right? Um, but I think for me, I was fortunate because I was doing, I was able to pour myself into things that I loved, right? I was coaching at the high school. Um, I had, I was able to train at a really high level again. Um, and I just found things to quite frankly, numb myself with, right? I just, I did what I needed to do to get through that moment. I didn't do what would have been the hardest thing, which is do the inner work and, and the heart, the things that didn't come naturally to me. But I, I, I was fortunate in that I leaned into positive outlets that got me through and at least onto the other side of it. And I kept founding, finding new ones. So I started my first legitimate business. I started my Instagram account. I started uh, training again, documenting that training, trying to build an online book of business. 
So I just kept putting more things on my plate to quite frankly um, distract me from feeling at all. I was a brick wall and opened or signed the lease to my first gym. So I kept just going. Everybody kept saying, incredible, you're doing amazing. You're so strong. I don't know how you're doing it. Uh, but I was so neglectful to probably what was building up within me at the same time too. And um, to your point about life continuing to throw curveballs, uh, it's crazy to think how small a moment that was in comparison to what came next because my parents are older, right? Life happens. Um, it was the first person in my family that I lost, obviously. Uh, you're shell shocked. You, you don't know what's right or wrong. You don't know what's you know. You don't know how to feel. Um, but it just it kind of just was what it was, and it was like I have to keep going. And what happened next was I think where that's when I threw my hands up in the air, and that's when I was just like, what the fuck? Like why? Why bother? Um, and so I know you obviously know my story, but. Mm -hmm. uh, August of that year, nine months after my dad had passed away, who passed away right before Thanksgiving, um, we had a home fire in my childhood home. So my mom was home. I was home. My brother was home. It's 3.30 in the night. It's literally something you would see on the news and never expect to happen to you. And we had a, a home fire. And um, I mean, without getting overly graphic, I remember waking up to smoke in my room, 3.30 in the morning, open my door, flames at my door, slam my door shut, punch out my window, stand on my roof, see my mom on the front lawn, yelling for us to get out of the house, jump off the roof, push my mom back, turn around and stare at my house, and it was engulfed in flames. Um, never seen anything like that in my life. And didn't know Jake was home. Uh, at the time, uh, obviously, it's it's the first thing you think about, and um, there was something physically holding me back from going in. Couldn't couldn't get myself to run into the house. Um, if I had, there's zero percent chance I'm coming out. No chance. And um, fire department lives on or is on my street. They get there in two minutes. Fifty firefighters. One of the biggest fires in. Union County history took two hours to put out and um, you know they came out and said that they had found uh, found Jake and to go through something like that physically to physically go through something like that where you're present you're there um, it's truly a traumatic experience at, at the highest level and um, that paired with losing your purpose, losing everything that you could, everything that you were driving forward for, despite how you were feeling, to have that taken. Um, and somebody who, you know, was my best friend, nicest kid on the planet, you name it. Um, you're just left with like a, a no, no juice. I had no juice to keep going. I had no, nothing in me that said like, just keep going and kicking ass. I just was... I was so empty again, and um, it, it it was unfathomable to think that there was any answer to the question why. So, we um, that next year was was brutal. Next year was brutal. And uh, I just signed, just signed the lease to my first gym. And pretty much my flow from there on out was not work for a week, be on the couch, show up for work, and try to distract myself. And slowly but surely, over the course of the year, I really dedicated myself to my training. I was training two to three hours a day just to, just to sweat, just to hurt, just to move, just to feel something. Yeah. Um, my clients became family because they just had my back. The kids that I was coaching at the high school all went to high school with my brother. So they were going through the same stuff. You know, They were working through what I was working through, supporting me immensely. Um, incredible group of guys. And um, 
you know, I think that year was one of those years where um, I don't remember it as well as I wish I did, you know. Um, I think I blacked out a lot of what that year really was. Because, again, I go back to the stories you tell yourself versus what really happened. Um, but I, I, I did what I needed to do to get through the other side of it and kind of get back to a place where I was building and making my brother proud and making my dad proud and really, really proud of the fact that I didn't go back to what, you know, I could have. Um, Because there was definitely moments of darkness and just grief and sadness and blame, right? A lot of blame. Um, But uh, at the end of that year, kind of a magical moment on the other side of this thing is uh, because I dedicated myself to my training, I wanted to do something that celebrated my brother and scared the shit out of me and challenged me and what have you. Uh, And it's so cliche to think about it now, quite frankly, is, you know, I had put uh, my first half Ironman on the calendar at the end of the year. And um, I didn't know how to swim. I had to take swim lessons. Barely know how to bike. Probably still have scars on my knees from falling off the bike so much. (laughs) Uh, Could obviously run. And I did my first half Ironman on on the day, the one year anniversary day of my brother passing away. Wow. And... I lit it up, dude. Like, absolutely destroyed the race. Felt incredible. Remember being on the bike and looking around at the guys next to me on the bike. I'm like, we are in amazing shape. How amazing is this? They're like, dude, shut up. We're like, we can barely feel our legs. <laughs> and I remember finishing the run. My grandparents were there. My mom was there. And I have this incredible picture. So I'll have to find it for you. Um, where I was just like pointing up. And I'm not religious, really. But um, I remember pointing up and really feeling Jake with me as I finished the race. And I kid you not, you know, f- whether it was forced or whatever, it felt like doing that race on the one year anniversary and just getting through one year of being without Jake. Yeah. I gave myself permission to live life again. And it was like wow. instantaneous. It was like the next day, it was like, go do this thing. Like, just go live your life. And um, I, can, I can say really confidently, since that point, um, I've definitely lived life with a sense of urgency, um, like this kind of calm confidence that like, I can go do it. I, I can go, you know, I'm worthy of it, all of those things. And that's a different, much longer conversation probably for, for a different couch. Um, <laughs> but, um, it was, it was a magical moment where I just, you know, I, I, I felt what I needed to feel, felt like Jake was with me. I felt like he pushed me through the finish line. And, uh, I just said like, go live your life, man. That's, that's what, that's what they would want. That's what your dad would want. That's what your brother would want. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. To do anything less would be a disservice to their entire memory, man. And you've done exactly that. And in fact, I mean, looking at who you are and the man that you are, I, I think it's, look, I, as difficult as it is, these difficult moments, like have a way, if you respond to it, to turn you into something really, I think, extremely powerful where you can step into yourself just as a leader that has, that's anchored more in humility and, and empathy where you can reach and connect more people because you felt this pain. You can relate to this pain to only know an existence where things are coming easy to you. And it's just like this smooth sailing. I just don't think that you know how to navigate life truly from that level. And there is a power in that man. And I, I truly, I, the courage and the strength that you have shown and continue to show. I just, I just applaud you at the highest level, man. Uh, being in that spot and having every opportunity in the world to revert back. No, like you said, nobody would have blamed you. These are the most unfair circumstances, but you have turned this into something beautiful that is impacting now thousands of people that visit your facilities that you work with, that you're helping every single day and you're doing it through a medium of training, but make no mistake, man, you're making people's lives better right now. I appreciate it. I mean, I, um, I would never wish what I've been through upon anybody else, but I am fortunate to have the byproduct of it, the perspective that I have. And because I have that perspective, I get to help people understand it without having to go through what I've been through. And I think that's, you know, if I was to ever say like, well, why did this shit happen? It's so that I can have the perspective that I do and impact the people that I get to impact on the level I do because of that experience. 
um, and it's it doesn't it doesn't make up for it. It doesn't mean that I want it, right? But I think there are times where you you want to you want to stop stop telling the story. You want to stop remembering it. You want it you want it to stop being true, right? Um, but then you hear from people when you share the message, share your perspective, share your story, share what you've been through. That story, like what I heard when I was in that room and I related to it, when that woman shared what she had been dealing with when she struggled with her addiction, what have you, um, it changed the trajectory of my life. And so if I can share my story in any capacity and any bit of it, any bit of it changes the trajectory of somebody else's life, that's pretty fucking awesome. Yeah. And it's powerful and worth worth pursuing. It is. We need to hear these stories, man. I, it, it, it's different, man. I because I used to tell the story too, and I, I've had this thought of, am am I expressing this because I'm coming off like, am I telling it too often? Because I didn't want to just keep talking about you know my father and a loss and like a woe is me type of feeling, but I started to recognize that when you speak from a place of strength about it, that this is how we connect. We're, we're sharing a story of, of overcoming. It's just connecting on a very human level of dealing with this difficulty and creating a source of inspiration in how you respond. It makes us human. You know, I, I think I, I heard you say this, that it's really a responsibility for us to share these stories in an effort to bring us all together for us to connect and grow. I think one thing that I, continue to go back to as well is we're more than what's happened to us. We're more than the stories that we tell too, right? And I think something that I'm always trying to think of is would I be proud of who I am now, what I'm up to now, regardless of what I've been through, right? And I think that's it. There's a powerful distinction there where you can go into a room. I can tell you everything that I'm working on now, the gyms, you name it, the, the championships, whatever. That's all good, but is it only impressive it is only something i'm proud of because i've been through x y and z or would it would who i am right now right here how i'm carrying myself is that something that i can be proud of regardless of what i've been through regardless of my story and as long as i answer that question yes then the story what i've been through only enhances it right only only amplifies it and so i want to always make the distinction that if i'm proud of who i am right now regardless of what i've been through that's a win, right? That's something I'm excited about. But it can't, I can't just be proud of myself because I made it through X, mm. Y, and Z. That's what makes me feel better about telling the story. I, that's very well said. That's anchored in like the present moment. There's a piece to that. Yeah. And, it's, and it's earned every day, Yeah, right? And I think that's, that's what I had to get away from because I think so much of my identity was you know, I got out of rehab, right? I checked myself in. I did the right thing. I made it, made it through losing my dad. I made it through losing my brother. But like, am, is that all, is, is that all I've got? Is that all of who I am? And it's not to diminish it, right? But am I proud of what I'm working on now, who I'm working on now, where I'm going, what's ahead of me, mm. right? Versus just what's behind me. Um, and that was a conscious shift where it was always, I was always moving in the right direction. Like, Everything was always good, but could I frame it in a way where I was okay with, yes, this is what I've been through. This is my story. This is a part of who I am for yeah. sure. Um, but there's a, there's a whole other side to that. There is. That's, that's a lot of self-work in and of itself because that's, that's a head game, right? That's like how you view yourself and, and, and how you see yourself, how you speak to yourself. I've certainly been there. That, that's something that you continue to work on. Because at the end of the day, I mean, like it sounds cliche, but you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, do you love who you are in this moment? And you're not something that happened to you. You are how you respond to it. And just, you know, do you do you love that person looking back at you in the mirror? I think, honestly, that's why if someone's listening to this right now and they're like, well, I'm not proud of how I've been showing up for the last five years, right? Like here I am telling my story. We're talking about what we've overcome and what we've done right as of late. That's great. But if someone's listening to this and they're like, well, I don't like how I've shown up. The good news is that you can make an adjustment whenever the fuck you want. Yes, you can. A hundred percent. And yes, it just makes, it's, it's a decision. It's a commitment. It's a promise to yourself. And there's no better way to, I heard somebody talk about this, no better way to build confidence than to do what you say you were going to do, right? To follow through with a commitment you made to yourself. 
And so the only way that I'm able to like look in the mirror and I have a hard time saying like I love myself, but I, I can, I'm pretty good at saying I'm proud of myself, which feels the same, maybe a little bit different. But the only way that I'm able to like look in the mirror and say I'm proud of myself or put my head down at night being like, you did a good job, man, is if I followed through with my word. For, for so long, I didn't. You know, even back to my college days, grand ambitions, big talk, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Not, never, never followed through, right? So now the measure, the mark of success is I say what I'm going to go do and I go do it, right? And that to me, if I can do that on repeat every single day, whether hard shit comes up or it's smooth sailing, that's a win. And if I keep stacking that time over time over time, I've got a track record of I'm the guy who follows the fuck through. That feels good. That's amazing. Stacking it together. It truly is a daily practice, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it's not easy, right? Like that's, no. and it doesn't even, you don't have to have these inc- like crazy, dramatic life experiences, right? I think there's also a point where people hear these stories and they're like, well, I don't relate. I've got a great family. No one in my family has struggled with anything. My parents are both here. Life is good. Yeah, sure. Right. And so they're just like, yeah, I just, I don't relate to your story. If you can relate to the little things, right? The little things that every single day still stand in your way of becoming who you say you want to be, right? Waking up when you say you want to wake up, having the hard conversation with somebody when you know you need to, call, checking yourself on your own shit when you know you need to, like, there's just human level stuff that we yes. all deal with. And I think that's when we bring it back down to earth, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you can just follow through and, and, and check that box, that's the win, right? And I think we can all relate to that. We can. That's the daily battle. And you can feel when you break that. Like I feel, when it, I, I feel that, dude, when I'm in the gym and it's that last rep and you just know in your head you gave it a piss poor effort, and you walk away, like that shit sits with me. And that's like the little stuff that you're talking about. You're like, I'm going to do this the right way so that I am leaving proud of what I just did, honoring the commitments every single day. And like when I've woken up on mornings where I said I'm going to get up at this time and I don't, it starts you off on a bad moment just straight away. But Sam, I, dude, your, your story is insanely inspirational. You're an incredible human being. You're an incredible leader. What you've accomplished, I have no doubt, is just the beginning of where we're going. Way more people to help. Um, I would love to have you back on the show. We got to talk about like actual training perspective. We'll talk about some <laughs> principles. We'll talk about workouts and stuff. <laughs> but this is such a big, impactful thing, man, because like the mentality and the things that are going on in our lives, this is generally, in my opinion, what really holds us back. You know, And it could be as simple as stepping into a fitness routine and saying, I want to adopt a healthy lifestyle, but there's something lacking mentally that is stopping you from doing it. Because I feel like the execution of this stuff is simple. The principles of you know, being healthy or being whoever you want, the idea of these things is simple, but there's, there's something internally. There's a battle that's going on in every single one of us. And so I thank you for sharing this story of how you've overcome this, how you've stepped into yourself. Um, and I want to leave you with one more question that I love to ask, man. If you could give yourself advice to young Sam, whether it be in high school or college, with the perspective that you have now, what would you say to that young man? I, don't, I would long sit down with this guy. <laughs> um, if I was to talk to myself 10, 15 years ago, I think the biggest thing that I could say that would actually resonate, right? Because it's one thing to say a message and have it just go over somebody's head. Uh, But hearing to myself to just keep showing up and keep doing the right thing, keep doing the right thing, if it's, if you could take that in so many different directions, right? But I think I would actually have known and understood what I was talking about. And to put that in context for you, it's all of the things that I'm talking about right now, right? That I talk about, you know, showing up on a daily basis and, being a good person, being a good son, being a good, you know, colleague, being a good boss, being a good parent, like all of the, like just doing the right thing. One of the sayings that we used to have on our track team was be a good citizen, right? It was like this one of the top four rules. When you think about that, like it's pretty basic, right? Had I kept that in mind during the darker times and actually applied it to my life, I think there was a lot of self-induced struggle that didn't need to happen. There were certain things as we talked about, losing loved ones, what have you, those you can't control, 
there was a lot that I could have controlled if I had just sh- shown up and done the right thing time and time again. And I, I just didn't. I just didn't. And I think that's, had I heard that, had I absorbed that, I think I could have um, surpassed a lot of the self-imposed struggle that I faced during that time. Sam, thank you, brother. Appreciate you, man. It was great. It was great. We're going to have Sam back. This is what this is about, man. Um, find Sam, Sam Tooley on Instagram. Coach.SamTooley. Coach. If we could get the Sam Tooley IG handle, that would be excellent. My guy doesn't want to Somebody got it, it? Yeah. He doesn't want to give it up. Oh, we'll couple bucks. send some DMs to this man. <laughs> we'll handle this over. But until uh, then, until then, Coach.SamTooley. Follow this, man. We are doing amazing things, dude. Thank you again for coming on. Um, Keep following Athletes Pursuit, sharing these great stories. Um, Until next time, my man.